Welcome in to Vol Basketball Fever, your number one source for discussions about the Vols and Lady Vols basketball programs. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a video and check in every week for new episodes of the show, video breakdowns, and more. Now, on with the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to another episode of Vol Basketball Fever. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, joined once again by Gene Henley, and we are back here for another episode of the show. Had a Lady Vol Basketball Fever episode last week. Now, Gene, nice to have you back, man. It's been a it's been a minute since you've done an episode. It's nice to uh, get back in the saddle. Yeah, man, it's been a while, man. It's been a crazy summer, but obviously, um, I figured this was a perfect time for us to kind of link back up again. Perfect week. Yeah, absolutely. It is. We just got through the NBA draft. We'll talk about that here in just a second. And also maybe even next year's NBA draft could have uh, some more Vol flavor to it as well. But before we get into it, again, I want to thank all of you all for tuning in to the show, whether you're watching on YouTube, which is where I think most of you start watching at this point now, or if you're listening to the podcast itself in the audio form on Apple or Spotify or Google Podcast, wherever you get your podcast, we really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for all the kind comments, all the five-star reviews you leave us. Um, you know, whether it's on YouTube with the comments or the re- reviews on Apple or Spotify, you guys are very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the channel and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet and leave the video a like on YouTube as well. That really helps out kind of the algorithm and help us show up more. And the more we show up, the more viewers we get, the bigger we can grow and the bigger audience we can reach. So we appreciate that a ton. And again, thank you all for your support. Well, Gene, as I just said, as, as the main story here in Knoxville and, and Vol Nation is right now, Kenny Chandler gets drafted into the NBA and the 2022 draft on Thursday night. Uh, not as early as pretty much most people, I would say, were expecting. I, I know he was kind of falling in some of the draft predictions and stuff um, closer to draft time, but still, I think the majority of them had him in the late first round, kind of in the, the last you know five, six, seven picks or so of the first round. Um, when it got to the point where I think it was pick 28 or 29, I forget which one the, the Grizz had at that point, and they picked... Uh, Ty Ty Washington, I said, well, he's going to be a second round. That that was the last team I thought that was going to draft him in the first round. What was that late pick by the Grizz? Uh, when that happened, I was like, yeah, he's going to get a second round. And ultimately gets technically drafted by the Spurs at number uh, 38 overall, but then he gets traded to Memphis. So Gene, he ended up in the place where I thought he would end up and where I hoped that Kenny Chandler would end up because he's from Memphis. Uh, I think the position there for him, he's he's friends with John Morant. Uh, he's going to be going there to, to battle for that backup point guard position um because Tyus Jones is probably out of there this offseason for Memphis ultimately that was the to me the number one landing spot that I wanted to see him go to um other than I mean by Celtics but I didn't expect them to draft they didn't have the first round pick and they didn't seem like they were particularly interested in trading up too much uh to be too active to do it even though there were a ton, just like every year it feels like there's a ton of trades on draft night in the NBA um, again, that Kenny Chandler was one of the players I was traded. I think Jaden Springer, I think was traded. He or Keon, one of those two guys were, were involved in a trade last year. And then two years ago or three years ago, I'm pretty sure Jordan bone or Admiral were involved in a trade as well. So everyone, it feels like there's just trades about every other pick in, in the NBA draft just about, but Gene, clearly the, the big conversation point for Tennessee fans and, and everything is Kenny Chandler dropping in the second round. And, I posted this on Twitter because I was curious why it was happening while his fall was kind of happening. And when he slipped into the second round, I was looking it up. Um, we've talked multiple times on this podcast about his, how his height would be, you know, the biggest detriment to him going in the first round or him going, you know, not being a lottery pick, not being a high first round pick, like him going kind of further down the line than people were expecting. And I looked it up. He's listed about six feet. So, I mean, he's, He's probably, I, I can't remember what his measurements were at the NBA combine. I think he was, he was six foot, but it wasn't like by a whole lot that he was six foot. Um, if I remember correctly, I was curious. So I looked up the last 10 years, you know, not including this 2022 draft. So from 2012 to 2021, the, the last 10 years of the NBA draft, how many guys listed at six, one or shorter have been drafted in the first round. It was seven, seven players in 10 years. So seven players and you, there's 30 first round picks. Seven out of the 300 players taken in the first round in the last 10 years have been six foot one or shorter. The NBA just puts such a premium on height. And that's not for, you know, you don't have to be like six six to get drafted in the NBA, but you, you can't be a small kind of diminutive guard, point guard especially, 
and teams want to draft. You have to have an, an otherworldly skill set to be drafted in the first round. Because the most recent one that I think that I remember um, that was one of the higher draft picks too was Trey Young. Uh, obviously, he's you know under six foot one. I think he may be barely six foot one, but he's a shorter point guard. But you know, coming out of college, I mean, he was an electrifying scorer. Uh, he was a guy who was getting double double after double double. I think a couple of triple doubles as well in college. Um, while he was there too, but it, it, again, you know, Kenny Chandler had a, a great freshman year for Tennessee. He didn't have a Trey Young type season at Tennessee. Um, it just it's very hard to teams don't draft, especially in the lottery. Uh, teams don't draft, you know, short point guards. And Kenny Chandler has great skill sets, but if you're a, a six foot one seventy five pound point guard, who yes, you shot the three ball really well and you, you drew up the basket well, but you also shot like 60% from the free throw line. I understand teams not taking them. And I also don't think it's a bad thing. You know, it, you know, you'd love to be able, if you're Tennessee, to brag and say, look, we've, we've had four first-round draft picks in the last four years with Grant, Keon, Jaden, and then and Kennedy. But besides that, like, I don't think it's a bad I mean, he, miss, he may be missing out on some guaranteed money as well, but ultimately, Gene, I think he ended up in a spot where – I think most people wanted him to go and where I think he ended up being in a, a very good spot for him. So I don't, I don't, when it's all said and done, yeah, it sucks for him that he's not a first round pick because of the money and it sucks for Tennessee because they can't brag about having another first rounder. But on all Gene, it, it wasn't too shocking. And to me, we'll get into the conversation in a second about him coming back. So I don't want to get into it, whether or not he should have, I don't want to get into that just yet. I want to kind of just focus here at first about his fall and why he fell. I don't think it's too bad of a thing because, again, I think he ended up at a spot where I think he has a, a, a really good chance of having success at Memphis because they've been they've done a really good job drafting the last few years and, uh, you know, kind of establishing that culture at Memphis. I think he's going to fit in really well there. Again, already knows John Morant. They're already buddies. Um, I think he has a chance to, you know, thrive. I don't know if he ever start because, again, John Morant's there. But, again, he, he could help his value and maybe – if he does get traded somewhere else or if he hits the free agent market in a few years, go somewhere else. But again, you've talked multiple times on this show, Gene, how you didn't think he'd ever be, you know, you thought he'd be a, a, a good backup point guard for most of his time in the NBA. And I think, you know, that's fine. If you can get a living like that, I mean, CJ Watson was a starter, but if you can get a living and be in the NBA for seven, eight, 10, 11, 12 years. And, you know, even as a backup, like that's a very sustainable, long money-making career for you. Yeah, obviously, you know, when you look at the end of the day, the kids get an opportunity to live out his dream to be in the NBA. Um, I, I mean, I understand there's probably some disappointment there, but like, I guess my thought was always when he announced he was going to go pro, if he came, if, if he came back, is he going to get taught? No. Is there a growth spurt that, that we just haven't seen where this kid goes from six feet to six five um, in, in the off season. I don't think that's going to happen. So you kind of are who you are. Um, he, he's not that much different in size from Tyus Jones, but Tyus Jones is a solid backup point guard. Um, and, and look, I mean, Tyus Jones had probably about as good of a freshman year as Kennedy did. And if I recall, that team won a national championship. I think he was on the 2015 Duke team. And, and so like what you're, you know, what you're talking about is, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Anyways, but. I'll, I'll look it up while you're talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, the, the way that I'm looking at his game, the way that I'm looking at how he plays, like, there are considerable issues with his game. He's quick, he can get to the basket any, at any point, but he can't make free throws. Uh, he's a decent shooter, but not great, not just consistently. If you're going to be six, if you're only going to be six feet, six one, you've got to, you know, you actually have to be like, have some elite skill. Like, I mean, people can make the comparisons to Trey Young, but Trey Young can shoot from 40 feet out. And Trey Young's a knockdown shooter, essentially from three point range, if he ever gets an open shot, which is very rare. Uh, in Atlanta because they run the Allen Iverson offense. And, and so, like, what you're dealing with uh, essentially is a guy who's going to be – like, la earlier in the year when they first got him, and we, I think it may have been last summer we were having this conversation, I said, look, man, Sharif Cooper went, like, 40 and had a and had a really good – in his time playing for Auburn, mm -hmm. had, was good. 
he's six. I just I was looking it up while you were talking. He's six one one eighty. So you're you're and he went forty. Like I think the only people that are surprised, I understand. Look, I think a lot of these draft projections are based off feelings, personal feelings, and not so much off of just knowledge of the game. Like he's not Chris Paul. And Chris Paul's greatest attribute is his experience. Chris Paul would have a hard time getting drafted early first round in 2022. It's just reality. Yeah, and he's like the last of a dying breed of just like point guards that kind of get you, get everybody where they're supposed to be and just run an offense and, you know, pass it, cut away, get everybody in their right spots, know all of that stuff. Like, that's just, he's kind of just last of a dying breed because now you just get the ball to your best athlete in a lot of cases especially if they're short and just tell them to go to work see John Morant now but where you know if we want to fast forward this thing to Memphis it's a good spot for him Josh sits out a lot Josh Josh slight too I mean we're talking about small people but Josh 6'3 and has ridiculous athleticism so that'll make up for a lot of uh that'll make up for that lack of size I mean, you know, Kennedy ain't is not jumping over people and dunking on them in games. It's just not happening. Um, but like, there's going to be an opportunity there for Kennedy at point. I mean, at, at backup point guard because backup point guard in Memphis is it's almost like let me try to make a a decent comparison. I want to try to make a football comparison to it. Um, no, let me let me let me do it this way. It's like being the backup point guard in Memphis is like being the backup uh backup to Anthony Davis with the Lakers. Mm-hmm. He's gonna get hurt at some point. You just have to make sure that you're ready when he does get hurt. You know, I'm not wish obviously I'm not wishing this upon him. I'm just saying the way the way that John Morant plays, he's gonna be nicked up, he's gonna have to sit some games out do the rest. Every single time that happens, Kennedy now has an opportunity to get out there and show what he's worth. Like, I don't think the day's ever going to come that he's going to be some elite starting point guard in the NBA. I don't think there's anything he could have done. Yeah, the, the shot percentages could go up, perhaps. I mean, maybe, but again, now he, but see, now, you know, if he, if he waits a year, now he's just six foot, 100, maybe 175. I'll give him five pounds muscle in the offseason. Um, now he's a six foot, 175 pound point guard who's now two years removed from high school. And in this day and age, you know, a lot of times you're going to look at that and say, how much better is he going to get over the next five years? So now you're two years removed of that. Like all the things that people are like saying could be issue. I mean, reasons that he could have come back could also be way, reasons that he just goes down to the G League and works on those, all of those things. Um, because you can look all around the league and see great G League stories. Just look at the Miami Heat. Just look at them. They're starting backcourt with she league players. Like both of them. Like there's opportunities to go down there and get better. And look, the fact of the matter and the ugly truth of it is not all these kids want to go to school anymore. I mean, we could talk about NIL and all this, that, and the other, but not all these kids want to keep going to class. They just don't. Like they just want to just kind of move on with their quote unquote professional life. And if you're going to give me, you know, what? I, I don't know what second round salaries are. I'll just throw a number out. If you're going to give me $800,000 to play basketball 24-7, 365, I'm down for it. I don't know what Eves made last year. I don't know that. You know, uh, obviously, Eves and Kennedy did not play there, uh, being played together. But obviously, it's, it appears that's, you know, that's nice that at some point, Eves and Kennedy have crossed paths. And... Uh, Look, Memphis is an exciting team already. They're not going anywhere. Um, and now you add an electric point guard. So we can talk about where he was. And I assume that's where it's going to be a lot of people's sticking point. We can talk about where, you know, where he landed up in the draft in terms of uh, placement. But I think I would prefer to look at just how he fits. And now you've added, a, you know, an electric piece to an electric team, man, with Desmond Bain. And, uh, I don't. I, I did not watch the draft last night, so I'm not sure who they got took in the first round. I did see some back and forth between Desmond Bain and Kendrick Perkins and John Morant. 
that I don't know, maybe uh, because of something Kendrick said, but uh, maybe they took Trevor okay. Kills. I don't know. That was that was the conversation. It was about Trevor Kills, and apparently Kendrick Perkins compared Trevor Kills to Desmond Bain, and Bain took offense. Uh, so, um, but whoever, I mean, like if they made moves, I know they got rid of a guy, sent him to Detroit, if I recall. Um, but now you have a chance with that, that's a fun team to watch with Jaron Jackson, John ja Morant, uh, you know, crazy Dylan Brooks, who's a, who's a crazy man. Um, you know, you've got great pieces there. They're a fun team to watch. Memphis is an electric place to play. And now Kennedy Chandler get, has a chance to go back home and play in front of that crowd for the first time in, what, like three years? Mm -hmm. I know he spent like at least one year at uh, Sunrise. So now that, and to me, that matters far more. Like the, where you sit, it's, I mean, we never have a problem having these conversations when it comes to like NFL guys. We immediately go to what's the fit? How does it look? But right now in this moment, we want to focus on, well, he should have come back because he went 38 as opposed to, well, how does he fit in where he's at right now? Like that's where I think it's the, the greater conversation because I don't think, I always thought it was a little bit of fool's go with like people who just wanted to make mock drafts and just said, well, he was a five-star prospect, so we'll throw him first round. Because I never once thought that he was a first round pick. And I don't mean that as a knock. I just look, I just let's just look at the league. He was the only player under six foot three inches taken. The only one. Now I get it, he's really good. Really good. But you also have to look going forward and a guy, a, a kid who doesn't get to the foul line a lot who doesn't make his foul shots when he gets there and, you know, can, can, go, can run hot and cold as far as three-point shooting, as well as decision-making, which, albeit, although it got better as the season went along, was not always great. There's a lot of things that you can question, and you have to be like, – if there are already things going against you in life, which in, you know, Kennedy's case is his size, then you have to have a spotless resume otherwise. And he didn't. And yeah. so, but like the fact of the matter is, he still ended up exactly where a lot of people wanted him to go in a great spot where he's immediately going to get a chance to go in and play. Yeah. And, and you mentioned two things there that I wanted to hop in on too. You mentioned the money and you mentioned the fact that, you know, he could now focus on basketball 24 7. I, I saw different comments and stuff saying, you know, he could have, you know, if he come back to Tennessee for another year, I mean, you know, look what Tennessee could have with NIL and stuff. You just mentioned, I mean, you know, he's not going to be making the multi-million dollar per year like he would have been if he's a first-round pick, but he's going to be making plenty of money on just his, his you know, the regular deal he'll, he'll get there, whether it's a two-way contract or whatever he gets um, with Memphis. You also have endorsements. I mean, he's got stuff that, again, that he can do that, yes, while well, you have NIL in college now, it's still not a free-for-all. He, he has an opportunity to still make more money as now a rookie in the NBA than he, to me, I think, than he does, he would have if he'd come back to Tennessee. And as you just mentioned, he can focus on basketball 24 seven. He couldn't do that at Tennessee. You, you can only have so many hours in a, well, technically only so many hours in a day in a week. You can you know do basketball stuff as a student athlete and you also still have to go to classes and stuff. The best way for him to get better and, and, you know, improve his game is to just keep playing and to just keep learning. Cause like you said, he's not going to grow another, even if he grows another inch, I mean, is there really that much of a difference between a six one point guard and a six foot point guard? Not really. It, it, for him to have a significant, you know, size change, you'd have to be three or four inches that he's going to grow, and he's just not going to do that much. I, I don't think that's that's unheard of. I mean, it's, it's it's happened. There's been guys who've grown, you know, quite a bit from year, one year to the next, and as as young players in college, but it's very rare for it to happen to where it's going to change your athletic, you know, traits enough to you'd move up significantly in the draft. I just think that it's looking through orange tinted glasses to say that he should have come back. And I, I you know, personally, I would love to have him come back. I, I wish he would have because I love watching him play. And because if he'd come back, Tennessee is a top 10, maybe top five team for this upcoming season. But that's the selfish part of me that would want him to come back. The thinking of it in his shoes, the looking at it from his point of view, from his family's point of view, like you mentioned there, Gene, too, like he hasn't played over there in several years. It's to be awesome for him to go over there and play in Memphis where he's from in front of friends and family who he hasn't played in front of in his hometown, at least in a long time. Um, I, I just like you said, I, I think the focus should be it. Obviously, it's not should be more on the fit for him because he could have come back to Tennessee. He could have gotten hurt and missed out a lot of money and maybe I've gone undrafted a period. 
and also, I mean, he could have, yes, he could have improved his free throw shooting. He could have improved on some things, but I just, I, I usually, I think most of the time, like 95 to 98% of the time think that if you're wanting to improve your game and improve your draft stock or, or whatever, most of the time you're, you're better off wanting to improve your stuff by just going the pro route rather than going back to college. And, and unless you have, I don't know, it's just, there's very, there are a few times where I thought that a guy made the better decision when I was, you know, Thinking unselfish and not looking at Tennessee, I looked at another school and thought that was the right choice for him to, you know, come back for another year. There, there are a few times where I've thought that that was the case. And you look at the last night's draft too, Gene. Teams don't covet college production the way that, you know, you might think as a fan that they do. Look at Patrick Baldwin Jr., who got drafted in the first round. Look at, um, I mean, Caleb Houston had a, had a good college career, but you look at what he did in the NCAA tournament, especially against Tennessee, he didn't do a darn thing in that game. There are just multiple people you can point to and say, Kenny Chandler had a better college career in one year than this guy, than this guy, and yet he was drafted so much further down. Kenny Chandler could have come back for next season for Tennessee and averaged 16, 17 points per game and improved his free throw shooting to 75, 80%, and still just maybe, maybe have been a first round pick, but still likely don't know if he would have been. And also at that point, the market would have changed for him. I don't know that he ends up Memphis, where again, I think, as you said, is a great fit for him. There could have been a team that would have been a good fit for him next year too. But I just think it just worked out serendipitously. That's hard to say uh, for him that, you know, wherever he went to, it doesn't matter if he was picked 25th overall. It doesn't matter if he's picked 38th. It doesn't matter if he's picked 57th. He went to a spot where I think he has a chance to grow his game a lot. And ultimately it's good for him. And it's good for Tennessee that he got drafted. It didn't matter if he, you know, would have been better, I guess, in a, in a PR perspective to say, yes, look, he was drafted in the first round or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, Gene, he's the third Tennessee player to be drafted in two years. He's the sixth Tennessee player to be drafted in the last four years. I also went back this morning. We're recording this on a, a Friday afternoon. I went back Friday morning uh, back in time to look at Tennessee's draft history. This, this is the first time since 1982 through 1985 that Tennessee has had um, this many players taken in a four-year span. That, that You go back then to 82 and 85, they also had six players taken in a four-year span into the NBA draft. And I, I think you go back actually from 79 through 85, I think Tennessee had at least one player taken every year in the draft, which you know they've never had anything close to that kind of streak since then. But they have a chance to do it now. I mean, this, this is, you know, people can moan and complain and say he should have come back. I just... I think it's very it's it's the more selfish of all fan aspect of saying he should come back. I would have loved for him to come back because again, I love watching him play in, in the orange and white. And I, I think if he come back for this this season for this team specifically that Tennessee has right now, uh, the roster they have, it's a top five team at preseason at least. I don't know you he knows where they end up in March, but it's a preseason top ten top five team with Kennedy Chandler on the roster. Um, but. I don't think it was the wise choice for him professionally, for him, you know, personally to come back for another year. And I, I wholeheartedly think it was the right choice for him to go pro again. He, he ended up at a spot that's good. And, and Gene, we can talk about that too, before we move on to the, the next subject here. But I think Chandler, again, I don't know what his NBA career, what his NBA future is going to be, but I think the Memphis Grizzlies are, a, a, as you mentioned, for multiple different reasons. I think it's a great spot for him. And I'm, I'm excited for him. Yeah. Let me just, let me just add this. Um, as the 38th pick in the 2021 draft, uh, the the Bulls took um, Ao Ao Desunmu. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry, just glancing here. I was like, let me see what he made. Uh, his first season, he made 925,000. That was base salary. Um, next season, he'll make 1.5 million. So you're literally like you're talking about a two-year, 2.5, basically million-dollar contract. Um, to just play basketball, to not deal with, you know, because the other side of NIL is, yeah, it's great that you have this NIL money, but you actually have to work to make that money in theory. Like mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of these corporations that have these NIL uh, sponsorships, you actually have to, you know, endorse the product. So you've got class, you now have to endorse this product that, yeah, it may pay you what three four five six hundred thousand dollars maybe even a million uh, who knows i don't know the numbers i know the numbers are out there uh they're getting up there i mean especially but you know I, i'm looking at it from do i want to if i'm going to work 
I'd much rather make because again, like you can do all those NIL deals and possibly not make nine hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Possibly, I, I don't know. I mean, I, Tennessee is now. Uh, I've been very, very impressed by how Tennessee has invested in its brand of basketball now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd imagine somebody like Grant Williams, prior to the nineteen twenty season, would have or the eighteen nineteen season would have been. Uh, well compensated. Admiral Schofield, the same thing. Um, the rest of the guys, probably not so much so, but those are the two faces of that team. You know, those two guys. And so, like, you're looking and seeing, um, like, the investment that's being made, especially from the people who make those decisions. Because I don't know who, I guess, Josiah and, you know, Santi are the, the face of that team now, um, w- which is fine. I mean, Kennedy would have not, I don't think, from a fan perspective, Kennedy would never be the face of this team. He would have to be so. yeah. not until not until Josiah and, and Bescovy Bes- leave. Mm-hmm. Like they just wouldn't be. So you're like, like it or not, we can argue who's a better player. That's fine if you want to do that. But these decisions sometimes are made by the people who the question at the end of the day is who has the best social media following, blah, 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 blah. So I say all that to say, you know, like now this kid has a chance to essentially make, you know, provided he's, you know, he makes the active roster and everything's fine there, chance to make, you know, $2.5 million fully guaranteed um, to just play basketball. Like, I don't care if he goes to, I can't remember exactly where their G League affiliate is at, but, and, and like, yeah, and we can all, I mean, we can all, um, you know, we can all sit here and talk about Keon Johnson and Jaden Springer and where these guys ended up at. But look, at the end of the day, if they don't want to do school, they don't have to do school anymore. I mean, like that, and, you know, like the NCAA, I mean, the NBA was able to get a year of exposure out of those guys, um, you know, by those guys going to Tennessee and playing. Same thing with Kennedy Chandler, where people got a chance and determined to see just how special this kid is as a player. But regardless of how special this kid is, he, he's still six feet tall. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw Stetson Bennett in Chattanooga a couple weeks ago. I, I saw pictures of him. He was a speaker at the banquet that we had for our newspaper. Um, Stetson is a small, small guy. Like, But, you know, obviously he's also the national championship winning quarterback of one of the the greatest football teams that we've seen in in, in history, specifically defensively, um, I understand like he's he's had a he had a productive twenty twenty one season, but he ain't a pro. And if you're small, you're going to be small. Yeah, he's knocks, he's five eleven by the way for way who doesn't know. The knocks that are going to be and he's yeah the knocks that are going to be against him now will be the knocks that are always going to be against some of those guys. Occasionally one of them overcomes it, but uh, I mean, and for everything that everybody's talked about, um, the NBA will pick on small guys defensively. And that's a problem too, which is why you can only play these guys certain times, you know, great defenders at six feet tall just don't exist. At one point, statistically, Trey Young was the worst defender in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Um, we all, a lot of people, however they saw it, saw Patrick Beverly call uh, Chris Paul a traffic cone, uh, which is an amazing, it, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but, I mean, like, and so, and that's what we're talking about. Like, you know, guys that we think are very small. Look, man, Steph Curry's small. He's 6'3", 200 pounds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, these guys aren't, I mean, like, you know, like the smallest guys in the league are bigger than you think. And like, and you'll see whenever, whenever Kennedy gets his chance, just how small he is. But he's a, he's a competitor. He's a fighter. Like dudes from Memphis always are, and he gets a chance to play in that city and that environment that's going to fully embrace him. Jaw's going to embrace him. Everybody's going to embrace him. He's going to have every chance to succeed there, because the, like the home the hometown guys are the ones you always want to see succeed, and specifically a city like Memphis which sometimes to his detriment holds on to his hometown people. See, you know, Penny Hardaway, who's had his struggles at times. 
Yeah, I mean, again, like, just saying that he's short, so he's not going to... Again, we're not saying that he's not going to have success, because there are, like you said, there are exceptions. Trey Young is an exception. He's a 6'1", like 165 point guard who had a phenomenal year, but you also mentioned his, def- his defensive deficiencies. There are other guys, I mean, Peyton Pritchard for the Celtics. I mean, he's a short guy. Again, backup point guard, but he's a short guy who, you know, has had a, a better, to me, a better career than I already expected him to have in, in the NBA. Again, he's still only his second year, I think, for the second or third year for the, the Celtics at this point, but he's had a better career than I thought he would um, coming in. But I, I also thought he was undervalued for where he ended up going in the draft. But just because he's short doesn't mean he won't have a good career. You mentioned, you know, that quarterback, Seth and Bennett, Russell Wilson is a 5'11 quarterback. But the majority of quarterbacks are 6'4", 6'5", 6'6", and there's always a big deal when they're not, and it's always a big deal when they have small hands. <laughs> Think back to uh, Alex Smith, and then I forget who the kid is this year. They're ragging on for his small hands, but... Yeah, yeah, can you pick it? Um, like, it's always a big deal when they don't have the, the elite measurables. Kenny Chandler just didn't have the elite measurables. But, yeah, like, again, I don't want to beat the dead horse too much because I feel like, I mean, this has been the, the biggest talking point, you know, for the past, well, not quite 24 hours at this point. But it's, it's been a big talking point. I, you know, I don't think that it will um, by this time next week. I think we'll have all gotten over it and everything. But I, I just don't think him coming back to Tennessee was the smart move, even if he didn't go – first round I just don't think that he would have bumped the stock enough to where it would have mattered a great deal um for next year's draft but we can talk all about we all we want to about this year's draft and Candy Chandler stuff I kind of want to look ahead a little bit Gene to next year's draft because there's already talk about Tennessee having another player or two or probably not three but at least you know a couple more guys going into the NBA next year we're getting to kind of see it's kind of nice to see some actual rooting, possible rooting interest for Vol fans in the NBA. That hasn't been the case for a very long time. Uh, I mean, there's, there was about a decade there where Tennessee didn't have anybody drafted to the NBA. Obviously you, you had a guy like CJ Watson who wasn't drafted into it, but he played in the NBA for, I think 10 years or so as a starting point guard for most of it. Um, but between Marcus Hayslip and um, Tobias Harris, I think there was a 10, nine year drought there where Tennessee didn't have any guys drafted. And, you know, guys would go in there like Tobias, or about, excuse me, like uh, CJ Watson, but they weren't, you know, I don't know. There wasn't, the, the NBA interest wasn't there for Vol fans. Now you have Grant Williams who just got to the NBA finals with the Celtics and seems like he's going to, you know, continue to be a, a big bench piece for them. You have Kenny Chandler who I think could be, could turn into a, a nice bench piece for Memphis. I'm interested to see what Keon Johnson does. You get to play a lot more down the stretch because, uh, Portland was, you know, purposely tanking and playing with the young guys. You know, does he um, use that to, you know, get more playing time and be a regular starter or a regular kind of sixth man or something like that? What does Jaden Springer do? You know, there's obviously been Tobias Harris for a long time, but I just don't think Vol fans had as much connection with him because he was a one and done, and he was a one and done in Bruce Pearl's last year, which was a disastrous year. If he'd been in, if he'd been on a different team, I think there'd be more connection to him. But I just don't think Vol fans have cared as much about Tobias because of when he played and you know, the unfortunate circumstances around that team. But you I mean, you, you have more rooting interest into the NBA now than you've ever had, or at least in my lifetime, for Vol fans. You can have some more of it again next year with ten, for Tennessee, Gene. It, it, one of the things I wanted to bring up was uh, Paul Biancardi, who does a lot of, he's a national recruiting, a uh, national something for ESPN. He does a lot of NBA stuff and, and scouting and NBA draft stuff for ESPN. Um, he was on the sports animal WNML this week, I think on sports talk. Uh, I, I know Vince Ferrara was when the guy I heard asking the questions and stuff when I went back and listened to it. Um, but he was on WNML this past week and was asked, um, he was talking about Kennedy Chandler reading really it for the draft and stuff, but was also asked about this coming team for Tennessee, you know, that's this 2022, 23 team and who he, you know, thought had, you know, the, what were the best kind of NBA prospects on the team. And, and no surprise, uh, he picked Julian Phillips because, again, you, you kind of project and look at measurables and look at athleticism, and, and Julian Phillips has that in spades. But there's a couple of things that he said, Gene, that really like stood out to me uh, when he was talking about Julian Phillips, and that was that he believes that he's going to be a lottery pick. Um, he said he's trending towards being a lottery pick, and he thinks he will be a lottery pick in a year or two uh, after Tennessee, because he thinks that, you know, he said he said that specifically because there's sometimes guys take, you know, an additional year to really, you know, get their feet underneath them and kind of realize their potential. So I, I feel like Julian Phillips will be one and done, but I thought it was interesting that he already kind of said possibly, you know, two years, depending on circumstances. But he mentioned that he likes to shoot threes and he's good at shooting threes. He, he likes kind of staying there and shooting threes and um, can do it well. 
but he says one of the things that really separates him and uh, you know that aside from his length and things like that too that are really making scouts drool um besides the fact that he's a six eight guy who can shoot the three is that when he gets the ball with a three-point line and drives to the basket he can get there in about two dribbles and gets there quickly and finishes really well at the rim and basically saying that was kind of his elite skill set there that um really separates him and that you know he, i think he said the the exact quote was it's just kind of a matter of um when he wants to give his all and be an everyday player is kind of when he will reach his potential and leave for the nba and i think at that point he was saying that he is trending towards being a lottery pick I mean, that, that's quite a bit of praise. You know, I, I just, I'm, I'm interested to see kind of, there's already been kind of early reports. I think Tony Basilio put on his blog some stuff that he'd seen or somebody on his blog put on some stuff they you know, were hearing from early, you know, June workouts from the team and stuff. And a lot of praise for Tyreek Key, which I'm not surprised about. Uh, me personally, I'm not surprised about it. There are already kind of some nice returns about Julian Phillips and, and his work ethic and everything. And I, I talked to his head coach at Link Academy uh, here on the show. Gosh, I guess month month and a half whenever he whenever he committed in Simon Tennessee not long after that uh I talked to his coach from from Lincoln Academy he mentioned that he's a hard worker and that he you know I, he just seemed like he's gonna be a good fit in the locker room for Tennessee in the way that Rick Barnes you know the guys he goes after and their work ethic and their their grind and stuff but Gene I mean I it's it's too early we're in June of we just finished up this draft we we there's no idea to know you know what what his ceiling is what he's going to do and if he's going to fulfill that potential or not but I mean, Tennessee's never had an NBA lottery pick because, I mean, you go back, like Bernard King was, you know, I think, what, seven overall, but they didn't have an NBA lottery back then. Tennessee's never had a lottery pick. The, the most, the highest a ball has been picked in recent memory was Tobias Harris at number 19 overall. Most of the guys who've gone in the first round for Tennessee have been in the 20s. It'd be incredible for Tennessee. It'd be just another kind of feather in the cap to, to put in for Rick Barnes and this coaching staff for <laughs> recruiting other elite prospects to say, hey, look, not only have we had this many guys get drafted and, and everything, but um, now we've had a lottery pick. I mean, it, it just, I, I think the, the potential is there for Phillips, whether or not he can, I guess, capitalize, capitalize. To me, I don't, I just don't think that even if he has a down year and, and one year at Tennessee and decides to go ahead and go pro his, his measurables and stuff, Gene, again, just mentioned Patrick Baldwin Jr. Earlier who went to UW Milwaukee as a five-star and he got hurt and was injured for a lot of the year and didn't really play a whole lot. He was still first round draft pick. I think Julian Phillips is that same camp where as long as he doesn't look like a complete disaster on the court and he makes enough of his threes and does enough offensively and defensively, he's a first round draft pick. It's just, it's just a matter of where he goes because unlike Kennedy Chandler, he has those elite measurables. He's able to, I mean, Kennedy can jump too, but he, there's a, there was already a video I saw of Phillips months ago, just leaping out of the gym. I mean, he has leaping abilities for days he has those elite measurables and athleticism that NBA scouts love. He's, he's going to be, again, barring a disaster happening to him or, or something, he's going to be a first-round draft pick. It's just a matter of where does he go. But, I, I mean, I just thought it was interesting that Bean Cardi already, already was talking about him potentially being a, a lottery pick in next year's draft. So, it's – guys like Julian Phillips, they get the – when it comes to the draft and follow me down this road, um, they kind of get the, they're going to kind of get some of that the Nathan Peterman treatment. Like they're going to have every, they're going to have to fail, like completely fall on their face and, and fail before they run out of opportunities. And so like the standard for, the standard for Kennedy Chandler was so much higher then it's going to be for Julian Phillips. Like Chandler was going to have to average 27 points a game, non-assist all season long, dunk on, you know, Kentucky's bigs, dunk on the LSU bigs. Like he was going to have to be just outrageously good, in my opinion, of course, to be a first round pick. He was going to have to so far exceed just simply being the number one point guard in the country. And that sounds stupid to say, but it's like, it's true. He was going to have to so far exceed everything that he had done, everything that people thought of him just to simply be a first round pick because the standard was so low for him. Um, whereas Julian Phillips, Julian Phillips can average nine points, four rebounds, two assists a game and be a lottery pick. Mm -hmm. 
like the state, I mean, because it's not the stats that are going to get him done. It's like, how does he get them? If he can shoot like 38% from three um, and shoot enough of them to where, I mean, don't just say, well, he shot 38% Well, he was three for eight. Like if he shoots like a decent amount of threes, which you're telling me that he does, according to uh, what the ESPN guy said, like if he shoots some a, a decent enough number of them and shoots them at a decent clip, that's that's great. If he shows his explosiveness and getting to the rim, that's great. If you know if he shows he can guard multiple positions, that takes it to the next level. Is that simple? Like, it, it truly is that simple. He's going to have every opportunity at the next level. Because yeah. at the end of the day, whether we all like this, it's the divide that exists right now between college basketball and the NBA is the fact that fans want these kids. It does not matter if, if Julian Phillips, fast forward to 2023, if Julian Phillips averages, those numbers that I suggested, nine points, five rebounds, two assists a game, and gets drafted 12th, there will undoubtedly be a fan saying, well, you know, if he had come back for one more year, he could have averaged 15 points a game and done this, that, and the other, and he would have been the number one pick in the draft. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But, like, fans, college basketball fans, want their kids to stay yeah some of them understand that they're not going to but it does make it does make in the short term it makes it hard to just root for anything but the jersey because like you're That's elite fair. of the elite you're elite of the elite they're not staying they're not staying i mean we can say Josiah and Vescovy, guys like that, but if they have the NBA grades that they wanted, they wouldn't still be here. And that's not a knock on who they are as, as college basketball players because I think that they're both great. I just think that that may be kind of where it ends. Like maybe both of them, maybe, you know, Josiah, he's got all the measurables. Maybe he gets a shot, but it's hard to find a spot where Vescovy at 6'3 as a shooter um, latches on, maybe, maybe not. And again, like an elite college basketball player, like we forget Marcus Hayes of a one, like he was great in college. Like that's when I was in school and he was there. I don't, he wasn't one and done, but he, he came out the exact same time Vincent Yarbrough did. And I'm pretty sure Marcus was what you said, 14th, which was right outside the lottery. And I think Vincent was like 34. Yeah, he was was 13th. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, yeah, he he was there. He, he was a, there for uh, three seasons at Tennessee. You know, he had a pretty good college career, but did he ever average like? Did he have like a 19 and 12 sort of season? Or I mean, not quite. But his his, his last year there, he was averaged 16.7 points and 6.7 rebounds that year. And I think yeah, he shot he shot three like 33% from three. So not like phenomenal from there, but yeah, he had, he had a good last year there. And that team stunk. Yep. <laughs> sure. For average. Like, look, man, Vincent, Vincent led the SEC in scoring that year, either he or Jonas Hayes. Uh, like they were like 18, nine, 18, eight, whatever. You can look that up, but I'm pretty sure like that's all they had on that 2001, 2002 team. Yeah. There was, it was uh Hayslip and Yarbrough were the only two, like that, that there's there was talent there. That is, it was Buzz Peterson. There so, were names, yeah, yeah. But you know, Buzz was you know that was right after uh, Jerry. They threw Buzz in there, you know, Vincent. Yeah, you know, but I, I say that to say, you know, when when the, when it when a fan base is like, man, we got a lottery pick, but what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like it is like I know the measurables. I I know of the practice where. Marcus Hayslip dunked on Vincent three consecutive possessions and Jerry, Jerry Green canceled practice because everybody was just going crazy. I know that was his, that was Hayslip's freshman year. Vincent's I think sophomore. Like I know those stories, those stories have been told to me. Like I know how electric and how great of an athlete 
Marcus Hayslip is at six foot ten. But the lottery picks sometimes under underwhelm you in terms of like what they did in college. I saw Bank Carroll play. I watched him. Like he was great. And he was also underwhelming. Because too many times I watched him in games and I'm like, mm, that Final Four game kind of need you to, you know, kind of need you to take over right here. Kind of need you to do this. Kind of need you to do this. Chet Holmgren. Mm, hit, hit some threes. Name was out there the entire time. Jabari Smith. Mm, how far did how, Auburn got beat? What, first round or second round? Second uh, round by Miami? Second round, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, like, but, like, their college careers can, would not match like their individual college careers may not match the individual success, uh, their individual success for whatever reason. Like that, that may that doesn't match what their potential lies at the next level. So when all these fans are saying, "I want that kid to come back," "I want that kid to come back," it, it's it's for your own selfish reasoning, and I get that. I'm not here begrudging. I'm not judging that. I, I also, but I'll, I say that to say it also does affect the fan. And look, I've never been a fan of people I always say that. Um, but I understand the plight that fans are going through right now because Julian Phillips may not live up to what you want him to be. Like when you hear the report that Ben Cardi, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, when you hear the report, you're thinking 19 and nine and five assists like top five, you're thinking like Kawhi Leonard, LeBron James type stuff, because he's that's what he's ranked at. A top five, like small forward, like a wing in the in the class, if I, if I recall. Like that's what he's ranked at. But guess what? He's probably not going to be that in one season at Tennessee. Yep. And that stinks, man. Like I, I'm, I'm the first to say it. it. It does. It does stink. But also look back on where Tennessee's at right now as a program, like to where, like, man, you went out and you got the kids who I've always said, look, they weren't developed to Tennessee. Maybe, maybe Admiral, but Grant was never developed. He just got a chance to showcase exactly who he was. Now he's being developed in, in Boston and now he's a great three point shooter. But you got both of those guys in the league as well as Jordan Bone. You know, obviously, then you have Springer and um, Johnson that go. Eve Pons gets a chance. And these are guys that are at least getting, in some cases, getting sports center moments. That's, you know, that helps your brand. But then you look around and you're like, man, freaking Milwaukee got a first round draft pick this year. <laughs> I don't mean, and I don't mean the Bucks. I mean, the University of, <laughs> the University of Milwaukee had a first round draft pick this year. You know, like I thought, I thought Tata Washington was good, but, you know, if we're just basing it off of production, first round, mm, like there's a lot of those cases, but that's not the measurement. But Julian Phillips, he is the measurement. So like I said, he's gonna have every opportunity. His measurables are probably pretty comparable to uh, Patrick Baldwin, who will undoubtedly be a Hall of Famer because he's going to the Warriors. Uh. But like you just look and man, it, it, again, it stinks, but. You, all, you also have a chance to enjoy this year and possibly the next two years. When you look around and you just see like the uh, potential that exists with these guys that are coming into your program, it may only be in snippets. They will never be the developed players you want them to be, but man, it could be fun at times. Um, by the way, that, I don't know if there's a, a better Choke, don't want to choke job, but a, a guy who wasted more talent on a roster than Buzz Peterson because that, 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 you go down a rabbit hole looking at that 0 2 season because he, Jarvis Hayes led the SEC in points per game at 18.6. But Tennessee had two of the top four scores in the SEC that year with Vince Yarborough and Marcus Hayslip. Um, and then Higgins wasn't a bad point guard in, in terms of least dishing out assists to had about four per game. And that team went 15 and 16. Like you, you have two of the top four scores because Yarborough averaged 18.1. Hayslip 16.7 and you finished below 500 overall and in SEC play. Like that's just, just disgusting, man. You had, I mean, Ron Slay on that team, you had, uh, that team had a lot of talent on there. I was looking at just a second ago that Higgins, Ron Slay again, as mentioned, um, 
someone else that on that team too. I mean, man, that's a conversation for a different day, but that just was such a waste of talent back in that 102. Oh yeah, you had a, a Brandon Crump on there too. Yeah, and Raw was SEC Player of the Year a year later, maybe two mm-hmm. years later. Hey, it's like I said. I mean, I, I forgot about my guy Ron. I, man, I. I think that was the year he got hurt, wasn't it? Where he uh. A one hundred two was the year he got hurt. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So I mean, maybe that maybe that played into it some too, but I don't know. But no, like it it, it didn't that much because I'm always going to be of the opinion that if you have like those weren't two freshmen. Like I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I don't care what the era of basketball is. If you have experienced wings, if you have experienced players, you should be competitive. Like I'll always, I will always say that. And look, man, everybody can have the discussions they want to have. You know, people feel like, man, Vince is always going to be my guy. People, you know, people that have that tried to talk to me about it have just talked about his motor. I get that. But you're also talking about a kid who's a senior who was top 10 in school history, if not the all-time leader in steals. Like, he produced. Marcus mm-hmm. Hayslip produced. And what else did you get? And that, and like I said, and John, like John, who still lives in Knoxville, produced. Knock down three point shooter. Like those are guys who existed on that thing. Like that that like that'll be one of the all time just how how did that happen, man? How? But again, I say all that to say it just goes back to what I was saying. Like Marcus Marcus, well people will look at well, they were fifteen and sixteen. Well, guess what? That dude also has a forty inch vertical and he's sixteen. We'll take a chance. Yeah. <laughs> Trillian Phillips is six eight. I, I suspect has a pretty nice little vertical. Obviously, he's explosive and he likes to shoot threes. And I think he can do so at a pretty decent clip, especially if guys like Edwards can get him open looks. Edwards and Ziegler can get him open looks, and whoever else can be added into that guard discussion. Um, like all those things can exist. You know, like. He's gonna have every opportunity. I said, if he has, say he averages twelve points a game, look, man, I'm a former, I'm a one-time Bulls fan. I think I've realized I'm just no longer a fan of them. Just as Tom has just <laughs> taken it away, I, I guess that's what's happened because I just really wasn't invested in them. Man, like two years ago, the Bulls took the sixth man from Florida State. Golly, man, I remember that happening. That, I think that was the final nail in the coffin for you, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, like that. So, so don't think it's all about the production. Don't think that the kids who average 24, 25 points a game are the ones who are going to get all the looks. Because guess what? Everybody loved Drew Timmy. Timmy got his NBA feedback and went right back, didn't he? Yep. He went right back to Gonzaga. I mean, I mean, if that was also the case too, I mean, Grant Williams would have been a lottery pick because he was a, a two-time SEC Player of the Year. I mean, if 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 you just took into account college productivity, Grant would have been a top. You know, fourteen pick in the in the draft too. Right, and at some point we're going to understand that. And like the things that you want to matter don't matter nearly as much as you want. And whether that stinks or not, like you know, the thing about college football is you have multiple years to figure out figure this stuff out. Although even now they're doing that because I'm pretty sure the DB from LSU hasn't been good since 2019 and or 2020 or whatever it was, and he was drafted like third. So, um, at the end of the day, you know, produce, you know, like win the genetic lottery. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say it, you know, uh, but that's right kind of what it is. You kind of have to win the genetic lottery and <laughs> some do and some don't. I hate that's, you know, that's where you hate it for Chandler, but you look at it from the other side and Phillips is like, you know, it's when other people always make the comment. Well, if I was such and such, if I was six foot ten and you know, and I could chip like that, I'd be. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know, but like I, as I said, Phillips is going to have every opportunity. He is going to have to completely fall in his face this year. Shoot like twenty two percent from three. Um, show an inability to guard. Like those are the two things that will not get him drafted. But if you see him have a five a game where he hits five threes, bye. <laughs> I wanted to kind of close out here, and I think it's a conversation to have in a, another episode where we have more time to talk about it. Just kind of like the expectations for Phillips in in, in his freshman year, because I went back to look at 
he's rated on uh, the two four seven composite as the number twelve player you know in the country. So when, you know, what have other number twelve players done? Just to kind of give a kind of a you know look around and, and see. Uh, last year's number twelve player was Peyton Watson, who's a six eight two hundred kind of you know forward kind of kind of built similar to what um, Julian Phillips is. Went over to UCLA, uh, played in thirty two games this year, averaged just under thirteen minutes per game. So didn't play a ton, didn't start any of the 32 games he played. Uh, 3.3 points, basically three three rebounds, and only shot 22.6% uh, from three and just under 70% from the free throw line. I think he's coming back for another year. I don't remember him being a, a draft guy. Uh, look at the year before that. It was Josh Christopher, who was a 6'5 guard, uh, ended up going to Arizona State. Had one year, then he went to the draft, um, played in 15 games for Arizona State that year, averaged 30 minutes per game, 14.3 points, 4.7 rebounds, one and a half assists, one and a half steals per game, and shot 30% from three, 80% from free at the line, and he went pro. I uh, don't remember where he got, he got picked number 24 overall by the Rockets in the 21 draft. So he got drafted uh, after one year. And again, put up some pretty good numbers. Only played in 15 games, though, um, for Arizona State that year, but put up pretty good numbers. But again, a 6'5", 215 guard who, you know, seemed pretty uh, legit as a scorer as well. Matthew Hurt was a 6'9", 230 uh, type of forward who went to Duke as the number 12 player in the uh, 2019 class. He went, he played there for two seasons for Duke. And then I don't see if, where he got drafted. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm just looking at the sports reference thing. They don't, they're not always the best at telling kind of what happened to him next. Uh, but his freshman year at Duke averaged 9.7 points, 3.8 boards, uh, just under an assist per game and 31 games, 22 starts and 20 and a half minutes per game and shot 40% from three. Uh, his first year there so again uh, kind of almost exactly what you said for what you but you know just kind of as your hyperbole or your I guess example for Phillips nine and four I mean this was 9.7 and 3.8 so I mean that was again he, he but he came back for another year so I mean that that's you know it, it we'll see with Julian Phillips I just kind of want to give kind of the last few years of where the number 12 player kind of what they've done and then number 12 in the 2018 class was go ahead sorry let me end my portion of the podcast by saying this. Peyton Watson was the 30th pick of the NBA draft last night. Oh, did he get drafted last night? Okay. Uh, played in 32 of the 35 games, averaged 3.3 yep. points, 2.9 rebounds in 12.7 minutes per game. Yep. The standard is so low if you are 6'8", 200. I don't know anything about his shooting stats. I don't know any of that stuff. Uh, he I'm shot 22.6% from three, 32.2% <laughs> overall, and 68.8% from three, the free throw line. <laughs> so not so good. That, so as I'm saying, is not a high standard. It's not. And look, and he, to be fair to him, to be slightly fair to him, he was on a pretty loaded team that went to the Final Four. Yep. Mm -hmm. in the COVID season and had, you know, Ju Zang was back. Uh, the point guard was back. They had the lefty. Uh, and I think he was number one was back. Like they had pretty much, and the positions that you expect him to kind of get in there and play, they weren't available to yeah. him. He was going to play, but coaches are always going to typically go with the guys they know, even if there's somebody that may, be better you're going to give those kids get those guys chances but you're not going to turn the keys over entirely to those guys so Ju Zang was always going to get um was always going to get every opportunity to play mm -hmm. and I think Ju Zang got picked up I think maybe uh Jules Bernard that's the guy's name yep that was the other um, guy yeah Jamie Jamie uh, Jacquez uh Ju Zang and Jules Bernard were there there and then uh Tiger Campbell yeah. they're kind of their main guys there all three of those guys, like Jaquez, 6'7", 225, Jusane, 6'7", 215, Bernard, 6'7", 210. Those are all experienced guys. You're going to play behind those guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you made a great point about first round pick. Yeah, I see. Made a great point. Played in, played in 32 games, less than 13 minutes a game, and three points, two boards, or three points, three boards, basically. And like you said, first round, I mean, barely first round, but still first round draft pick. So... Yeah, uh, the last one I was going to mention was number 12 in that 2018 class was Ashton Hagens, um, who played at Kentucky in his first year. Obviously, a different different position as a, as a point guard. Um, but 7.7 .7 points, 2.6 boards, 4.5 assists, 1.6 steals, and but only shot 27.5% from three. He ended up going into um, – I think he went to the NBA. Yeah, he's in the NBA. He, he I don't know what he's doing in the NBA, but he went up there. Um, but I don't think he ever made it. I don't know if he ever not? played again. Okay. 
I'll look uh, it up. One of those guards off that team. Uh, he, well, I guess he looks like he may be with the Raptors. Uh, okay. The G League. Yeah, he's Raptors. in the G League. Yeah. Um, I don't think. Yeah, I feel like he went crazy up there and had a situation. I don't want to say crazy. I don't want to besmirch his name, but um, looks like he may. Oh, he played 2021 with uh, Timberwolves. Okay, so maybe yeah, he won. two games. Um, yeah. I, I don't think he scored anything though. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Though I mean, I mean. I didn't realize he was the cousin of uh, former NFL running back Ronnie Brown. That's interesting. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, like you said, you just college production matters some. Like you can't just, for the most part, you can't just have a you know bomb out and have a a bad season and still get drafted. But then again, you look at we just mentioned for the for the. I mean, like you said, it's a different situation. You say it wasn't like he was starting. Uh, Peyton Watson, and then, you know, was playing poorly. He was playing behind experienced, very talented guys. Um, but still got drafted number 30, uh, the last pick in the first round, um, which is kind of surprising to me. I didn't realize that happened last night, or I, or, you know, just wasn't paying attention when it happened. But anyway, it, it just, like you said, the you get so much benefit of the doubt if you're a, a 6'8", 210 forward who can shoot the three and also finish up the rim. Like, if you can do those things... You 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 have so much benefit for the doubt, and, and scouts love you. So, um, Gene has been great having you back on here, man. Uh, looking forward to hopefully doing another one next week. Um, might do a mailbag one because I'd like to hear some of your all's questions because I'm sure you have ones about Kenny Chandler, Julian Phillips, and also just you know players in the roster for this next season. Maybe recruiting questions and stuff. So, I'd love. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it now. It'll be whatever we do next week will be a mailbag episode. Um, so go ahead and send them now if you want to. You can tweet us at Vol Hoops Fever. You can tweet me at Mr. Underscore Rutherford if you want to do that. Or also if you're in the um, Twitter community on there that we have the Vol Basketball Fever uh, Twitter community, um, send them in there as well. So just let us know if you're going to leave a comment here on the YouTube video if you're watching. Uh, definitely do that too. But uh, Gene, thank you again so much for, for coming on here. And thank all of you all for uh, listening, watching along. Uh, no matter how you're doing it, really appreciate it. You guys are fantastic. Love all the support you give us. Uh, thank you all so much for it. Uh, give this video a like if you haven't, and subscribe if you haven't already to the podcast or to the YouTube channel. Signing off for Gene, I am Nathaniel. This has been another episode of Vol Basketball Fever. Thank you for watching Vol Basketball Fever. Give this video a like and subscribe to the channel while you're here. We appreciate all your support, and the show wouldn't be possible without Vol fans like you. Thank you.